Late 60s, the whole world changed again and people started moving around and all these college kids came out here and the coffee scene started, the coffee house scene started and people started hanging out in town. Most of these fiddlers we've been talking about were rural. They were based in rural areas. A lot of this music was happening in homes and in Grange halls. And then in the late 60s and on into the 70s and up until today, the emphasis kind of shifted into the more the urban scene. And Warren Argo is in the audience. And he, did you bring your fiddle? Do you want to come up and say a few words? So Warren is well known in this area. And I'm sure you've all seen him down in the roadhouse if you've been in the roadhouse. And he is very famous in fiddle music. Very famous. Very yes. Well loved. Well, uh, we'll see about that. I grew up in California, and I was influenced by some country fiddlers that lived in the San Joaquin Valley. Had very, very good. Uh, Ron Huey was a welder in Fowler, California, and one of the best fiddlers I ever knew. He creamed all the contests down there, but really, he just loved to play the hairy old, hairy old dance tunes, and it wound us all up. And we sort of had a diaspora where all the old time musicians down there went in different directions. I wound up here and ran into Phil and Vivian, fortunately, very early in my arrival here. And all the other things I was doing, uh, the music was growing. I heard how they played. I had a lot of tunes in common with them. And one thing that seemed to develop was an interest in dance. And somehow that was the one little piece that was missing. There was a, I guess there was some dancing still going on, but the sort of the neighborhood access stuff was yet to be found and somewhere in the 70s it caught on uh, I worked with a guy in the woods who knew some square dance calling and then uh, the band I played in went to Expo 74 where the little folk life festival that was set up with the Expo had uh, a guy came down one night and said hey I actually know how to do this there was a guy reading calls out of a book you know and we were playing music to him and it wasn't working too well but it was happening and he said, I really know how to do this. And he said, well, show us. And he grabbed the mic, and he was loaded with all these these uh, enormously wonderful, engaging, rhyming, singing, patter call things he did. It just revitalized all our interest in it. We came back to Seattle and started dancing in the taverns. We had had it. We played with the same place that Phil and Vivian played down on First Avenue. And we'd sometimes get as many people in there listening to us as there were in our band. And that was a, a good <laughs> night. And we'd play four sets of music to a total of nine people and uh, go home feeling pretty good. All of a sudden, we were playing dances, and there were 150 people in there. And we couldn't help but know the difference at the end of the night. You know, we actually were making money, and we started, uh, and, and the whole thing kind of took fire from there. And now, you go down one floor and see what's happened. It's like there's hundreds of people down there, and it's it's wound up back in the hands of the people again, which is really, really sort of the whole issue. Actually, is that everyone found they could play for dances, they could dance, they could call. They, you know, it's it's all of our belonging. You know, it's we all have this thing, and so I feel terrific to have had the opportunity to sort of move from place to place and all of a sudden have the thing sort of take fire around me. Hundreds and hundreds of people are involved in this having happened. But it's alive and well. Look at the kids out on the corners playing. I mean, oh, so yeah. that's that's how lucky I am. I don't know about you guys. Do you want to John's fiddle and No, it's okay. I'll, I'll just sit up here. Something comes up, I'll blab again.